Let's speak to Matthew Goodwin, academic and writer. He's got a column in The Sun today about the new elite. And there are pictures of the new elite. And they use Carol Vorderman, Alistair Campbell, uh, Emily Maitlis and Gary Lineker. Now, what puts them all... I think the only person in that grouping that doesn't have a podcast for, with uh, Gary Lineker's company is Carol Vorderman. So maybe they're working on that. I don't know. Matthew, very good morning to you. Welcome. Good to be with you, Mike. Thanks very much indeed. We've been wanting to get you on for a while. I was I was first actually um, drawn to you this week by the piece in the Sunday Times about um, the sort of the shifting sands, if you like, of of, of, of the Great Britain that, that we know. You're you're not quite as old as I am. Um, I'm probably quite a lot younger actually. But but I've seen a very big change in the last sort of ten years of just the way that people. Uh, kind of talk to each other, the way that people react. I know that London has now become a, almost a sort of a, 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 a cosmic sort of se centre all of its own, nothing like the rest of the country. Because whenever you go anywhere outside of London, people behave very differently. But, but this new elite that you talk about today in The Sun is very much London-based, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. What I'm talking about is the rise of a new governing class, basically, not just in our politics, but in the creative industries, cultural institutions, some parts of the media. I'm talking really about professional middle class graduates live in the cities, university towns who basically hold an immense amount of cultural power, not just economic power, but cultural power, who are basically in charge, Mike, of um, determining what we can talk about, what we can't talk about and how we think about other groups in society. And what I think, at least over the last decade, when you look at the rise of Brexit, you look at the rise of populism in British politics, this sense among millions of people that the elite has lost touch. My personal view here is that actually I think it's a lot to do with this new uh, governing class in the country that really holds a set of values that lots of other people don't hold and which is often not really that interested, Mike, in giving people a serious voice in the national conversation. Yeah, and interestingly enough, I mean, you talk about a progressive sort of cultural revolution, the same thing or a similar thing is happening in America. But it's all very much about silos, isn't it? It's all about your own echo chamber and not listening to anybody from outside of it and declaring that anybody who doesn't think the way you do is somehow evil or amoral or somehow, you know, it's like this we all hate. The number of people that you see on, uh, on social media who say in their profile, I hate and detest all Tories. And you're kind of going, what's wrong with you? You know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, take Twitter as an example. We know from the research Twitter is dominated basically by left progressives who tend to be more intolerant of people who hold different political beliefs to their own. And I am calling this group out in this book, Mike, because I spent a lot of my life looking at the populist right. A lot of my earlier career was on the populist right. But I genuinely believe, Mike, that we now have a very serious challenge from what you might call the woke progressive left. I think this is a really big challenge. And if you look at how they're trying to impose speech codes, how they're trying to restrict freedom of speech, um, how they think about issues like empire, gender, what we should teach children in school, um, all of these things. Um, they are often in a world of their own. They're often holding values that many other voters don't hold. But the crucial difference, Mike, is they also wield considerable influence over the institutions, over the schools, over the universities, over the media, or over the creative industries, the advertisements we see on TV. And I think many people are just sitting at home, maybe watching this show, listening to this show, thinking, you know, what on earth is happening yeah. to this national conversation? What's happening here? And this book really is about trying to explain how this happened. Yes, well, I think it was very much um, uh, kind of concentrated, wasn't it? And we could see how this is all working over the whole Gary Lineker uh, stramash, as I call it, you know, when he basically likened the uh, Suella Braverman policy on migrants to uh, 1930s Germany. People started arguing about whether he meant the Nazis or not the Nazis. It doesn't really matter. I think it was obvious what he meant. But the number of people who kind of filed in behind him, who are from these new elites that you talk about, this new sort of social uh, mob, who basically are for open borders, because by and large, one of the things you point out is that they don't live in urban centres. They don't live in poor parts of the country, these guys uh, and women, so they don't really feel the effects of mass immigration. Well, exactly. I mean, there's a hypocrisy that comes with the, the new elite or what, what other academics have called the luxury belief class. On the one hand, they promote policies like higher immigration, looser borders, uh, radical gender identity, um, in schools and universities, um, but often they don't really have to suffer the consequences 
of those decisions. Mm. I mean, they're very relaxed about the family, for example, yet at the same time, they're the most likely to get married, to stay married, to have their kids within the context of a marriage. So they're often advocating, you know, a very sort of radical social liberalism or a kind of woke progressivism, which they often don't really suffer the costs of. And this is a hypocrisy that I think many people can see. So if you look at the Gary Lineker case, Mike, you know, Gary Lineker strongly opposed a government policy, right? That's a 15% position in this country. 15% of people agree with him. Now, if you look at the national conversation and how it was framed by the BBC and others, you, you would be left with the impression that this was a 75% position. Yeah. And yeah. this is what I'm talking about, this disconnect, which is leading lots of people to say, hang on a second, my values aren't in this conversation, my voice isn't in this conversation, and now they're looking down at me as a sort of inferior underclass of ignorant gammons mm. and racists. And I think a lot of people out there basically have had enough of that. Well, they really have. And, and also th to be painted as some kind of cruel individual because you don't want to have something happen uh, to your country which you don't recognise anymore uh, is absolutely and utterly ludicrous. But unfortunately, because so many of these characters are in the media, I mean, of those people uh, who the son of pictures, I know you'll be talking about other people, not just Carol Vorderman, Alistair Campbell, Emily Maitlis and Gary Lineker, they're all in the media. You know, and so the message, I mean, Carol Vorderman has kind of turned from what used to be a rather, um, you know, pleasant presenter to sort of somebody who seems to have lost the plot and is attacking the Tory government at every single moment. You wonder what's happened to her. Yeah, I mean, it's not only the, 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 the media too, Mike. I mean, if you look at the university vice-chancellors, my, my world, the, the, the professors, the people who basically control, you know, what we call the constitution of knowledge, uh, the gatekeepers who basically determine what's acceptable to discuss and what isn't. If you look at the MPs in Parliament, if you look at the civil service, if you look at the creative industries, the museums, the galleries, the publishing industries, basically that public square, right, is now overwhelmingly dominated by graduates typically from elite universities who often come from privileged families who tend to share the same sets of cultural values on these new big issues that we're debating mm. immigration small boats gender britishness who are we mike as a country and what really worries me why i wrote this book is because if this gulf between the elites and the masses continues to grow and grow and grow we're going to have a really big problem in this country and the populism and the the political turbulence that we had over the last decade may just be, be end up becoming the beginning of this big blowback mm. from voters who are saying look i've got to get back into this national conversation because these people running the country are not really interested in people like me no and they're not really interested in the country I mean, so many of them can be characterised as, as though somehow, you know, they're, they're not particularly proud of the country, they're not particularly uh, happy about what is going on here, they, they constantly have a go at the government, uh, they call the Tories the party that ruined Britain, you know, they all wanted Brexit not to happen, but it did happen, so they haven't forgiven anybody for that, you know, and it seems ludicrous to me that, that these small numbers of people can 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 sort of command such attention because i mean look at the guardian today for example i mean a great example of the left sort of eating themselves the guardian decided to set up an investigations unit to investigate their own history and have now decided that they've got all these links to slavery so now they're going to give 10 million quid away uh, by way of sort of reparations to parts of america and you're going yeah. sorry yeah, yeah what's going on the, here's, yeah here's the thing mike what's happened is the old elite used to derive their status their sense of esteem from their wealth from their uh, ability to take holidays, from fashion. The new elite derive their status by being countercultural, by basically critiquing, if not repudiating, national institutions, uh, national culture and traditions, whether it's the royal family, whether it's British identity, whatever it is. Uh, Daniel Bell, uh, my academic hero, first noted this in the 1970s. He said, the issue with the elite as it passed through the universities moved into these institutions is that it was becoming openly countercultural. Mm. so you know it, there's also again a hypocrisy here you you're allowed to critique the identity and the history and the culture of the majority group in your own country but you're not allowed to do that for any other group around the world or any minority mm. group so there's a very imbalanced approach that sort of drives this reaction within this new with within this new uh this governing class and mike unless we can get away from this divisive identity politics which is another thing i call out in the book mm. and say we've got to get back to unifying stories about who we are we can't just keep telling kids that they're only defined by their race or their gender and we can't keep um, putting people into these segregated silos based on their group identities we've got to get back yeah. to what we have in common 
not what's pushing us apart. Because if we don't, Mike, we're going to have a big problem. Well, I think that's right. I watched you last night on Piers Morgan's show and you were sitting between uh, two other guests who were both absolutely convinced that you were the devil incarnate, uh, one of whom was Ava Santina. Um, and, and basically uh, talking about how you're not allowed to use a meme uh, if, it's, if it's a meme of somebody who happens to be black. And, you know, I mean, Piers was on your side as well, but, but we have sort of gone into this kind of, gone into this weird rabbit hole where there's only two ways to go, apparently, and you have to pick it at the beginning and you have to come out at the other end. You know, you can't have your mind changed for you. That wouldn't work at all. You have to firmly believe something and everybody else is wrong. I think if you look at the last hundred years or so, basically we transitioned from a culture that was about dignity, was about honour, was about bravery, into a culture that's now overwhelmingly about victimhood. Mm. That's the key shift that's happened. So if you can define yourself as a victim, if you can define yourself as somebody who is an ally of victims, uh, again, perpetuating these narratives, then you are a high-status individual, Mike. If you align yourself with this radical, woke ideology, as far as the elite are concerned, you're a high-status individual. If you know all the language, white guilt, white privilege, heteronormative, cisgender, if you can demonstrate to your fellow elites that you're part of this new religion, because I, I do genuinely believe it's a new religion, then you're going to be a high-status high individual. But what if you're white working class? What if you're culturally conservative? What if you haven't gone to university? What if you're an apprentice? What if you've gone into a technical college? What if you live on the coast away from the big cities? What if you're looking at this country saying, actually, I'm not sure we should continue to have hyper globalization or mass immigration? What if you basically hold a set of values, Mike, that put you on the wrong side of the prevailing culture? And I think that is basically where lots of people today find themselves. They're looking at the institutions and they're saying, you know, it's not only that I'm not in those institutions, it's not only that my values aren't in those institutions, it's also that they're now looking down mm. on me as white working class, ignorant gammons and Karens and, uh, all, and, and, and the rest of it. And this is what I'm worried about, Mike. This is what caused Trump, right? This is what caused Trump. This is what's driving populism across Europe. This is what's also, by the way, leading lots of people, which I suspect will happen at the next general election, to give up on politics altogether. Mm to yeah. say, you know what, I can't even make a difference in the system, I'm going to sit it out. And that is also not a good place no. to be. Let's get these people back into the conversation. Absolutely right, because then uh, otherwise you end up with what's going on around the country in various different councils where they're just deciding, you know, willy-nilly without really uh, any kind of thought process for the people who voted for them uh, to do all sorts of things, closing off roads, putting in speed restrictions, putting in speed bumps, all of the stuff that, that is going on around us for which nobody seems to have a voice. But at the final analysis, I guess, Matthew, what we're saying is the new establishment, if you like, uh, the people that run the museums, the people that run the civil service, the people that run various departments of government, you know, it's, it's become a very left-wing outfit, hasn't it? Overwhelmingly leaning towards the left, and essentially what's happened in my mind, Mike, I think the evidence backs me up on this, as these institutions have become dominated by graduates from elite universities, and as those graduates have moved left over the last 10 years, partly in response to Trump and Brexit, they basically radicalised they're taking the institutions with them. So if you look at the adverts on TV, great example. I don't know about you, but the adverts that I see on TV are, are certainly don't reflect why no. the British society, right? No. They reflect the worldview of this new elite. Like, this is how they would like the country to be. Mm. This is how they sort of perceive the country to be, you know, when they're doing the, the design clips and the adverts in, you know, Stoke Newington and Shoreditch yeah. or wherever. Um, and I think this is this is ultimately what's going on, that we've got this, this kind of geographical... Uh, separation, this cultural separation, and now this political separation with a left-leaning elite. And I include Conservative MPs in this, mm. Mike. Most Conservative MPs are much further to the cultural left than most of the voters who are voting for them. And then you've got the voters, on the other hand, who are saying, come on, guys, let's let's. you can do a better job of representing a large chunk of the country who don't really think like this. And to be honest, just, just want the country to be a little bit more representative of the groups that mm. live in it. Yeah, absolutely right. Imagine that. Uh, it sounds extremist these uh, these days, all, all of that stuff that you've said, but it's great. Matt, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. The book is called Values, Voice and Virtue, The New British Politics. It's out tomorrow. Uh, we'll speak to you again soon, Matthew. Thank you very much indeed. Matthew Goodwin there.